We start off this fabulous day with a workshop on visual merchandising and I'm sure all of you realize what an important part of retailing that is. The person who's going to come and talk about is an expert who will show you how you can transform your passion for design and creativity to create a perfect design process and if it's visually not selling, it's not visual merchandising. So I'm going to introduce you to a visual merchandising expert and retail practitioner who has uh, a lot of experience under his belt. He studied interior design at the Parsons School of Design in New York. He specialized in visual merchandising at the Art Institute of Seattle. In fact, there he was honored uh, on the wall of fame. He has uh, given visual merchandising a new definition, both tangibly and figuratively, because he has clients ranging from Titan, Lifestyle, Sicily, all the way to Stanley, Boutique, Taj, Khazana, Godrej, Levi's, and many, many more. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Ashmeet Alan, the principal, Transform Design, and he's also the director of Academy of Applied Arts, where many students have passed out under his uh, stewardship. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Alan. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about visual merchandising, touching base in terms of what the real definition of the subject is. Of course, if it does not enhance selling, it is not visual merchandising. So it's not just about the beautification of the display or to present it in a way that it just looks pretty. But the purpose is to make it look in a way that you augment the sale process. We're talking about augmenting the sale process, not even just necessarily increasing the sales. Because there would be an example, for instance, which is valid for all of us, that we would probably have at least one piece of merchandise in our wardrobe that we bought maybe out of peer pressure or salesman pressure or something and we landed up never wearing it. As a result, we not only hate that particular piece of garment, we sometimes hate that store or that brand. So we were able to make that sale once, but we lost the client probably for a longer duration. The purpose again is to understand where is the client coming from, what are his needs particularly. And while creating the beautification process. Also creating in terms of the tangibility, the usability effort of it. The new age visual merchandisers are also the fashion designers where we would put a particular theme in terms of accessories and merchandise and be able to educate the client in terms of how to probably put it together. I'm going to quickly start with uh, understanding the different kind of store layouts. The first kind of layout is called a grid layout, which is basically how grocery stores and FMCT stores are laid out. Very grid, very graphical in order, just like a bar graph now. In this particular case, for instance, the client might enter, you know, and the entrance becomes from different parts. And the cash tools are here. The grid layout is made up in a way that the visibility is increased. At the same time, the sense of discovery is also ensured. It is observed that the moment a client enters into a shop and is able to see everything in the store, they become bored very soon. And it becomes very difficult to keep the client alluring for their next visit. It is not possible to read to the store or pay the merchandise completely. This is another example of the grid layout, for instance. The other kind of layout is called the free flow layout. A lot of smaller stores do a free flow layout, which is, again, based on the sense of discovery and then you maneuver the face out, shoulder rounds, two ways, four ways. In this particular case, for instance, if the entrance happens right in here, uh, there would be a bunch of nesting tables, other merchandising racks, which uh, would at the same time stop the flow of the client. The intention is for the client to not just walk in from an entry point and go all the way to the end. Larger grocery stores in the Western world used to do that. They would usually keep the bread, butter, and milk right at the end of the store, even if the store is 40, 50, 60,000 square feet. It was beneficial that because that is the need-based product, the client is forced to walk all the way to the end of the store. But it also backfired. It backfired in a way that as time is becoming a scarce element, people don't like to go for basic things and spend so much time to do the parking and to do the walking. So 7-Eleven caught up in a big, larger way. 
And the intention was that those 7-Eleven and other stores, top-up stores, might charge 10 to 15 percent extra for that same merchandise. Client, at the end of the day, saves time and is okay spending that. Precursor to that, how the large industry responded is that they started opening up bakeries at the first part of the shop. Earlier, they used to be florists. So when you have a bakery, one, the moment a client enters, you might have heard, never go to a grocery store when you're hungry. We'll end up buying a lot more things that we'll end up probably using at all. When we see the bakery, we're also open and susceptible to paying a much more premium because it seems fresh. And that's how you can see that the formats are changing in response to how the clients are shopping. That's another kind of layout, for instance. The entrance becomes over here. The intention is for the client to not be able to walk straight up towards the end and then climb up first, but to break the flow with the nesting table or other interesting elements. That's a racetrack layout. Typically grid format. It would have an outer periphery where the client can walk in through a larger speed. And all of this area would be a part of the race track layout. In between, we'll have the zones where we create a bubble diagram and then do the rezoning in terms of SKU movement and planning. A spine layout is very simple. You enter into a point and then you get out right back. Heading bone is usually used for bookstores, CD stores, musical stores. Pretty simple in the case. However, all of this is now being amalgamated into the thought process in terms of how we see things and how we buy. So for instance, if I request you to look at where my hand is and look at this point, you will realize that if I, you have to look from here to that fixture, your vision will not go in a straight line. It will always follow the same path which is directed. If your vision is going to follow it, you will follow it physically too. And that's one of the ways how you can lead clients into the zones that you choose them to be. Over here, for instance, one of the first things that a client sees is three little circles over there in terms of light. Now, circle is the most attractive shape when it comes to the human connotation. We are more likely to see anything circular, even if it's one third the size of any other shape, be it a square, rectangle, or a triangle. This case, for instance, the point was to not make the aisles very large and waste a lot of space because every time you've given even two feet larger to an aisle, you might lose up the opportunity to put one more rack or a gondola or an end cap. If you look at this image, more than likely, depending on the view that you have, your eyes are going to come and pause at this carpet area, which is basically that the client picks up a book from just about anywhere, but they would like to go and stand in this area, which again means as a retailer that you don't have to spend a lot of space on these areas, but only get space in this. So you land up saving a lot of space, and hence adding up merchandise and racks on the other areas. If we look at this store, this is an optical store. In one vision, let's say, it's my question to the audience, where do you think is the more premium merchandise? Do you think it's on these units, or is it in this little hub over there? What do we think? In the back, in the glass case, so that's how the store becomes a silent salesman. You don't need to tell the client this is the expensive department and this is not. Lots of times if a client comes into your store and it's his first experience to your brand or to your store and he lifts up the price tag and he finds it expensive, in his mind he creates a thought that you would be an expensive store. He would be reluctant to look at other things. It's also observed that if you go to a store, any genre of store, and if you look at merchandise, and if you look at the price tag of the merchandise, and if you look at three, three different product prices, and not by anyone, you will not even look at the price tag of the fourth one. In fact, you're not likely to buy at all. Now, all of this comes from a huge amount of psychology driven in terms of environment. The layout part. Of course, when we do the larger specialty store or department stores, Different kind of forms have to be developed in terms of how do we move into a space. You might already be aware of this fact that typically Indians, when they move into a space, a new space, they move and look towards the left. And Americans move and look towards the right hand side. 
We don't know the reason. One of the reasons could be to do with the driving side, because Britain works the same way. People move and look towards the left. So while having this knowledge, how can you use it for your retail store? You can use it in a way. If you know people move and look towards the left, maybe that should be the last point for a cash counter. Because cash counters are the last point of interaction. If you're done with your dealing at the cash counter, you're most likely not going to buy something else because you don't want to stand in the line again. It's like dining table in a house. You know, when you invite somebody over for dinner and cocktails, and by the time you invite them over to the dining table, it means end of party. It's the last term of process. There would be different kind of sizes considered in terms of how much area you need to give in. Now, retail has always been working in terms of square feet. But a newer way to work on it is to work on linear feet. But the latest and the most accurate way is to work on volumetrics and not on square feet. For instance, square stores usually land up wasting a lot of space. Rectangular stores are usually speaking better. Volumetrics works in a way that you get a linear footage, for instance, we we'll discuss, let's say, a jacket, a men's jacket. So a men's jacket is going to take about two feet, three inches in the premium environment. And the lesser you go in the price point, you have to give lesser amount of space. The value comes with abundance. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, you give two feet to the jacket. And then how many pieces do you do behind it will also govern how much quantum you have and how much turnover you can do. And how much housekeeping cost you can save. And what kind of storage facility you have as well. So all of that put together is a matter of volume because you're considering the height, the width, and the depth. And that's the basis on which all retail will eventually land up being, unless it is online. Different kind of layouts. Of course, the top one works better for a slimmer store, thinner store, where people can move towards the left. Again, in the American, they can move towards the right. People go into different zones. Uh, the gray pattern is basically for the main aisle. You would try to observe this. You would most likely not find anyone who is walking and has one foot on the carpet and the other on the tile or the stone floor. They might not be looking, but we never walk like that. You would never find somebody who is walking under a half beam. They would either be rightly, correctly under a beam, correctly under a pole, or completely out there. We don't like to walk in the periphery. Brain works like that, right? So this gray area becomes the main aisle. You would also notice that the speed of the customer is higher in the main aisle than is on the subsidiaries. For instance, when we are walking in a mall and we are not interested in shopping from any of the shops that we are passing, our speed, of course, increases. The moment we are interested, subconscious takes over, we slow down. This used to be, till the early 1980s, the most successful store layout plans which was also called the frog. So you would have this, and that's where the perfumeries took over, that all the perfume divisions used to be right over here, or um, the cosmetic division on the ground floor. It is also observed, surprisingly, that for the, for the people who've traveled out, why is it always that the ground floor is usually for women and not for men? Have you observed that? Almost always is that. Why do you think that is the reason? Any guesses? Sorry? They're the main shoppers. In some ways, yes. In some ways, yes. Uh, however, in terms of the quantum, if we look at the overall turnover for retail or shopping, men contribute more than women. Women contribute a lot towards lifestyle. Men contribute more towards general turnover. The one factor is, when women shop, and when women shop for something which is vanity driven or glamour driven, they like to be seen doing that process. When men shop, they don't want to. In fact, given a chance, they would also say, turn off the ambient music. Think about the time for men and for women. For men, when you're buying a very formal suit for a very important occasion, which is maybe a very important business interview or something to do with business or to do with a wedding, something very important to you you would want undivided attention. For women, that's not the case. They want other people's attention on it too. So it works. Okay, now, 
I'm not trying to get into the gen gender bias, but the point is if we have this kind of knowledge in terms of what works better for whom, we'll be able to draw out our stores accordingly. That way, not only do we make our retailers successful, we also make our clients successful. But there's just basically two parameters to make a client successful. You save him money, you save him time. If you save him any one, no big deal. If you save him only money, it's a risk because online is going to take over. If you save them only time, it's a risk because online is going to take over. So the brick and mortar store can only possibly exist if we have these, but a much larger context than all of these put together would be the experience. Because the majority of the clients that we deal with, I think all the clients that we deal with, because we don't deal with people under the poverty line anyways, they're not our clients. So almost all the people that we deal with, they don't shop for the need of it. They shop for the want of it. Now, you don't need another shirt. You want another shirt. It's not that your shirts are torn that you have to. It's not that case at all. And fashion exactly works on this term, which is highly capitalistic. That till the time you do not tell me what I'm wearing is out of fashion, I don't need to buy the next thing. Because to begin with, you told me it's good quality, which means it should last me four or five years. But the fashion cycle is only a fraction of that. That's how a bubble diagram is done. Now, bubble diagrams are done with the merchandisers of the store, in which the visual merchandisers, the merchandisers, and the store division sits together, say, OK, these are the places where we should zone different kind of merchandise. And this could be different uh, in Delhi, and it should be different between Delhi and Noida, and it should be different between West Delhi and South Delhi. And it should be different within South Delhi between Greater Kailash, Part 2, and Kalkaji, while the division is only maybe a couple of meters or only across the road, and you enter into a different kind of a thought process altogether. So in all these domains, we're talking about reflecting the client's mindset and making them successful. Because if they buy, we become successful automatically. All we need to do is just present them the right picture so that we become their favorite place to shop at. You would also observe that if you have a favorite brand, now the majority of us have a favorite brand, if you have a favorite brand, you are more than likely also having a favorite location. So you like a favorite location, you go to another location of the same store, you like the merchandise, the price is the same, the quality is the same, just about everything is the same. You will like it, but you would not be able to buy it. Doesn't that happen often? We don't know the reason. We think we'll come back again, we'll take a second opinion, or all the things. But it never happens. It's all based on psychology, of the space, of the environment, and its impact on us. Now, this is basically calculating the volumetrics as well, figuring out how much space you need to give to which zone, which is the bubble diagram. And on the basis of this, the retail designers or the architects which gradually make out the layouts and start working on the drawings, which is more grid format, cat based. The other kind of change which we're seeing, for instance, again, we're talking about an experiencing environment. For instance, you know, it's a kind of changing room. If you're selling outdoor wear, then why can't the changing rooms be like this? Where you feel the merchandise right there and there. Lighting plays a very big role. We're going to cover it later on. Uh, anything which has to do with vision has to do with light. Yeah, you throw yellow light on red, it becomes maroon. You throw white light on red, it becomes almost faded white. Like a, there's a potential for it to be almost pink, but not hot pink. Hot pink will again need a lot of yellow light. But for instance, if you're an Indian traditional wear, and your target audience is either bridal or things which have to be worn between the functions. What stops us from doing a chandelier in the changing room? People will remember only what they expect the least. If you give them what they expect, they wouldn't remember it. Nobody is doing stuff in the changing rooms. That's another kind of changing room. So the critical point of visual merchandise. It's to romance the merchandise. We are not buying the merchandise anymore. We're buying the aura around it. We're buying the espionage around it. So it is not about just that product anymore. It's about the feel, it's about the lifestyle. And that's why we're investing crores of rupees in marketing 
on advertisement campaign in terms of what is to be worn, who is to wear it, who is the model. That's why we're spending crores of rupees on Bollywood models. That's basically just taking the image of the company, taking it forth, reflecting it to the target audience, speaking to them. What do you think they're selling? I need your participation in the next uh, uh, 20 some slides. It's only going to be better than the bags. Okay, so can you tell me something about the bag? Tell me something about the quality of the bag. What do you think? It's good quality or bad quality? Sorry? Yeah. Okay, the other very important thing. You know, any reaction that your brain has to have, which is the real reaction, happens in fraction of seconds. Not half a second, in fraction of a second. I wish I could do that as an experiment, but for instance, just imagine this, if I pick up a pen and I throw it at you, you will be able to catch it? Yep. So if I pick up a pen and throw it to you, you will know two hands on one hand? You have decided that? You have decided like this or like this? You have decided like that? So you also know if it's rubber material, it's going to stick on, you don't need to do this. If it's plastic, you'll grab onto it. You have also ascertained the weight of it. You have also ascertained the speed of it. Fact is, it's going to reach you in less than one second. So imagine all the detail that you've already calculated in less than one second. We think that a customer is looking at our window or our display or our merchandise for minutes. They're not. Within a fraction of a second, they decide if it's interesting or not interesting. For instance, we have all traveled from home since here. On your way, you must have seen at least a few hundred billboards and graphics. Correct? How many do you remember? One? Two? Maybe not even one. Because the brain's not interested in something which is normalcy. Come something which is abrupt or abnormal, we will remember it. Think about this as well. You do not remember probably one or two examples out of the hundreds that you saw since morning. But if you opened the door of a single shop even a week ago, you would remember it. Isn't that true? It's basically because there are multiple senses involved. In vision, of course, there's only the sense of vision involved. But when you have to open the door, your vision is involved, your motor skills are involved, your hearing is involved. Because you're calculating just the way you would calculate to catch the pen. You're calculating the weight of the door, the height of the handle, the thickness of the handle. It's like, for instance, you know, if, I'm, if I'm thirsty and I have to drink a glass of water, it would make a difference how much water there is in the glass because I'm going to calculate the weight. It's going to make a difference how far is the glass. It's also going to make a difference if I have to pick it up from here or pick it up from here. Because of course, I can move it like this or I can lift it up and move it. It also makes a difference how formal is the meeting I want to have that glass of water in. If it's very formal, I'm not going to lift it very high. For example, if you're sitting with somebody for a very formal meeting, very important meeting, most likely meeting the person for the first time, and if you're having coffee with them, the sips that you take will be small. If you try to have a big sip, the body would just not gulp it. It is strange, but it often happens. We talk about red being a bold, attractive color. It's not that somebody told us red is a bold, attractive color. It's basically because of the way we've been living, and it's to do with evolution. We're going to talk more in detail. So the bag again. Good quality, bad quality. Good quality, expensive, and expensive. Expensive, good design, bad design. Don't be critical about it, because whatever reaction you had, you had it in a fraction of a second. Now you're only trying to justify your reaction. And mostly we are only trying to prove our cash, Or we're trying to justify it with what is the general opinion. How about the design? Good or bad? Good? Okay. Fact is, we don't know anything about the bag in terms of quality or in terms of price. And design is subjective. But it looks like it's good quality. It looks like it's a good design. It looks like everybody wants it. And how expensive is a display like this? Less than a thousand. More than likely, you will have all these mannequin hands already. All you need to do is just paint it. And the yarn, I don't even think it will cost 10 bucks, maybe 20. Is it hard to do? Not at all. But wouldn't your customer love it? 
Can you not do this for any other earth item for that matter? Now look, the same guys have done it for hats. They just made it more playful. So it is romancing the merchandise. Not just selling the merchandise, but selling the espionage and the aura around it. Because it's not about the shirt. How many people can really justify it? or understand the difference between a 400 rupee shirt and a 4000 rupee shirt. Does it actually cost 10 times? Do they actually care about the mother of pearl button or nylon button or otherwise? Do they actually know how many threads per count there is in the textile? No. But they're just going with the image that they have of that perceived brand. Now who makes a brand? Customers make a brand. Who made George Urban? Not George Urban. People made George Urban. People's perception of it. Clients decide, are you going to be successful or not successful? Clients decide, should they go with you, should they invest in you or not invest in you? And this is what you do to prove them right, to believe in your product. Look at this. Can you guess the price of this is there? Take a guess. Please. Sorry? 20,000? Okay, thank you. No, but that's not the right answer. Another guess, please. Sorry? 5,000? No. Thank you, but no, that's the wrong answer too. Sorry? Less than 1,000 rupees? It's less than actually 500 rupees. Less than 500 rupees. And I'll explain you what cost is that 500 rupees. Okay, so you see these red things are single core copper cables. Electrical cable, Polyclap, Kalinga. When you the brands? A cable. How do you make this? You inflate a balloon, like what we used to do when we were kids, and you tie this around it. If the visual merchandiser is attentive, he can just do this entire three things with a single balloon. Inflate, wrap it around, deflate, pull it out, do another, do another. Okay? There is a little stand over here. That one's hanging from the top, and then there's a little stand which you can see from the little thing coming up. And that's it. It's really easy to do. I think the problem happens when we think that a really in fantastic solution will only come if a fantastic amount of effort has been put into it, and a fantastic amount of money. But it doesn't have to be. The only way visual merchandise has made its mark and become so successful over the years is because it is inexpensive, it is dynamic, and if something goes wrong, you can change it, in most cases, overnight. So it is always in tandem, and it is always in response with what is working and what is not working. You can always tweak it and improvise it. Look at that, for instance. Clearly a stylish casual, but does it look cheap? Inexpensive, maybe, but not cheap, no. Which mass market store cannot do it. I sometimes hear that, oh, you know what, we're mass market, we shouldn't do it. We're forgetting that we might be mass market. And even if I'm selling a shirt for 100 rupees, I should not forget that the person who is investing in that 100 rupee shirt, he is investing in that 100 rupee shirt to look good in it. We might discard it saying it's just 100 rupees. But he can only afford that. He wants to look good. You want to make him successful by liking himself in it, rather than feeling like a reject. There's hardly an expense done on this one. And then there's hardly an expense done on that one too. Good. Now, one of the brands is doing something with paper. I just noticed the season itself. Look at this brand. Now the malls are giving us really tall ceilings. When we do a store like this, doesn't it look a lot more inviting, a lot more lifestyle-centric? Yeah. There's a level of romance in it. There's a level of glamour in it. Without having the merchandise glamorous, because you don't need to necessarily sell short dresses to be appearing as a glamorous store in your facade or through your facade. But the way you take care of all these elements because glamour is not, or style is not something which only comes from the merchandise. Stylish is the person. Glamorous is the person. Sophisticated is the person. You don't dress up sophisticated and look sophisticated. 
because people who are really sophisticated look very sophisticated even in torn jeans, isn't it so? They look glamorous in just about anything they wear. In fact, whatever they wear becomes glamorous. It's not about what they're wearing a lot of times, it's how they're doing it. It's like Shif Kena says, it, when you're just going to do different things, they do it differently. Similar context. Look at this for instance. It doesn't cost a lot at all. How can we make these little spheres in a cost-effective way, for instance? Take a guess. Thermocol, yes, in a way. However, thermocol has, has an ability because it has those little balls. When you shave it across, the balls come up and it doesn't give you the smooth surface. That becomes a problem. How else? But thermocol, yes. How else? Painting plastic balls. Sorry? By painting plastic balls. Painting plastic balls, yes, you can. But it becomes a hassle because you have to source so many different sizes. Of course you can, right? But all efficiency for a professional lies in what? Saving time, saving money. Yep. And the only thing any professional, including a visual merchandiser, of course, the only product that any professional sells is time. Because we don't sell experience, we don't sell product, we don't sell designs, we don't sell ideas. Because if you sell it, it's not yours anymore. So it's the wrong connotation, it's the wrong word. We only sell time. That's why we charge three times more when it's a thousand square feet store versus maybe a three or four hundred square feet store. This level of investment that you're doing, it's not that your design changes. If you're doing 500 store or a thousand square feet store for a particular brand and that brand takes up 2,000 square feet, you charge higher. Not because of a new design, because you have to restrict the old design itself. Not because of a new idea, because the same thing. It's only the amount of quantum of time that you put in. Now, balls, yes, you can do it, but it'll take a bit more time. How else can you do it? Sorry? I, I didn't get you, sorry, a little bit. Stones, very heavy. Yes, you can, but it will be very heavy. So, the back and forth might become a problem. How else can you do it? Balloons. Yes, but balloons have a tendency to deflate over a period of time. In two or three days, they completely you know, get lost out of the air. What else? How else can you do it? I'll give you a hint. Thermopole is one end gradient, for instance. However, thermopole has problems. So what you can do is, there is there's a spray glue which is called spray mount. It's just like you get uh, spray cans of paint. And you spray mount this on it, okay, and then you roll it over either sand or any of the very little brittle material which can take in a kind of glossy paint which doesn't absorb it. And then you finish it with a final coat of paint. That way you can get any size you want. For instance, you have a store window which is this size, but you might have another store window, maybe the depth is six feet. You can control the depth, you can control the size, and you can control the number of balls. The other intention is how can you possibly do the rollout all over the country? It can only happen if the things are lesser brittle and lighter in weight and do it. Because we you have this one. They don't even have a dress. All they need to do is laser cut these butterflies, put them on strings, put them around the mannequin, and pull them towards the fascia. The other thing that you can do is you can take these elements and also replicate them in store. You can replicate these elements in the changing room. When we look at a display window, by the time we enter the store, more than likely we have already forgotten what we saw in the display window. So sometimes we spend a lot of effort thinking, let's do the window nicely, it will increase sales. No. Will it increase walk-ins? Maybe. But sales? No. And visual merchandising is not about just increasing walk-ins. It's about increasing the client experience. Visual merchandising, of course, has only two elements. Either you increase the sales or you increase the perception of the brand. And if you don't do any of these two, then it's anything else but visual merchandising. The art, graphic design, just about anything else, but not visual merchandising. Look at this, for instance. Our clients are tired of looking at just mannequins wearing dresses. There's no charm. And then we are spending time and money on doing that. It doesn't lead to any revenue escalation at all. Consider doing something like this. 
were not even entertaining the clients. And I believe when I turned the slide, almost everybody paid a little attention to this one because it's different. Does it cost a lot? No. Look at this one. Very stylish. You can change the color of the light. This seems like an evening gown, uh, you know, like a ball dance kind of thing. You can change the connotation. You can change the faces or the wigs of the mannequin. Wigs are very easily available in India. Fairly good price. You change the hairstyle and the mannequin becomes different altogether. Would you realize that all the mannequins, all the female mannequins, are the same mannequin, same face. Only the hairdo is different and they all look different. All of them are the same. Just one little window and you do a shadow box around. Now shadow box is a technique in which for instance if you have a big display window and let's say you have to display a watch. A display a watch in a huge window you would not be able to see the watch. So shadow box is a technique where you crop the window size, you reduce the window size so that you can focus only on a particular thing. So for instance, a shadow box, um, in this case, in this graphics case, all of this we don't pay attention to. But it is necessary because it brings our attention onto this. Even the fold, because the eye follows the direction, brings our attention back to that. If this was not there, this would look fairly bland and very static. You see suddenly there is a level of dynamism in it. That's what happens with eye telesization. So you crop the display window rather than having your complete eight feet or nine feet tall glass facade. You reduce the height, you reduce the height, you, when you escalate it from the bottom, so you're not showing the complete window. You crop some part there, you crop some part here, and you crop here. So you get a masking or a masked window. You reduce that and you give a feel like that. And then this can happen in probably any season or maybe any product. There could be a handbag in her, uh, in her hand. There could be a pair of shoes. There could be, of course, this dress. There could be anything. There could be a lady looking at her cell phone to, to type something. People would be interested in what is this mannequin doing because, again, there is a level of differentiation. Very simple to do. Graphic produced or downloaded from somewhere, printed on vinyl, pasted at the back, two same kind of merchandise. If the merchandise was very different, then it becomes a little clumsy. So merchandise has to be similar, either in color or context or silhouette, and then the merchandise takes over. The other element of merchandise, smell. When it comes to the brain processing and the longevity of information in our heads, the sense of smell has the longest amount of memory recall. A typical smell can take you back years and put you at the exact same spot where you smelled that thing first. It could be tens of years. Think about this. Think about a restaurant, a South Indian restaurant. Now think about the sambar, the smell of the sambar, vada, rasam, dosa, uttam. Sambar, chutney, South Indian, and now try to have white pasta. You would not be able to consume it. That's how strong sense of smell is. So sense of smell is, is research to trigger particular kind of emotions. Of course, we talk about uh, aromatherapy in terms of how senses uh, trigger it. But then there are particular kind of smells which cause us to walk faster or talk more words per minute, or uh, talk at a louder volume, or it expands our uh, body over our volumetrics. The second one is sound. Sound triggers us in a very big way. Here this example, for instance. I was at Harvard at the end of last year, and I was trying to speak to a professor about something very important. And as I was speaking to the professor, some lady kept on interrupting. I would barely be able to speak a sentence and then she would say something else and interrupt. And this kept on happening for about five, six, seven minutes. What is important, however, is not the conversation I was having, but more important is that suddenly when I reduced my volume, 
I had your almost complete attention. Did you realize that? When I went low on volume, I had more attention from you. He has given more. You would have noticed this, that in a meeting, if there are 10 people sitting, and everybody is talking, and there's probably one guy who's not talking, and when there are 10 people talking, usually people interrupt each other, but when that one person who has not been talking, irrespective of whatever important level he has, when he speaks, everybody listens because he talks less. Same connotation applies to the volume. If I speak in a lesser volume, I will get more attention from you. If I speak in a louder volume, your brain likes to think you're going to get the information anyways, so you feel free to do whatever you have to do. Do you get it? So, you can use it in your stores. You can make your customers walk faster. Denim stores, what do they need? Sportswear stores, what do they need? They need speed, they need dynamism. So you would usually find rock or electronic or the same centricity or genre of music. It's to do with pace. Imagine rock music at an Indian ethnic garment store. Women selling bridal wear. Wouldn't work. Imagine Bollywood fast music, would it work? Now we just know it wouldn't work. I'm not telling you anything new. All I'm telling you is to be aware of what you do as a human being because if you are doing it, the other human being who happens to be your client is doing it too. It's like if I ask you this question, if you can point out where your kidneys are, we all have kidneys, right? So if I ask you to point out in the right direction exactly where your kidney is, you will probably not be able to do that. Fact is, you've been living with it for at least 20 some odd years. That's a minimum wage. But we're not updated about it. We don't know about it. If we can be more aware of why we do the things we do, we can take a gestation in terms of what is the other person likely to do in a situation like that. If we do create an environment in terms of store, in terms of sound, what is the reaction of the other person going to be? And you tune it down accordingly. Temperature plays a very large role. And I should share with you that I was in university in America. I used to find it fairly cold. Yeah, a little chilly. But I thought that's the way it is. You know, it's, it's a cold temperature country. Uh, I was in that part. Maybe that's the way it is. After two years, I found out that my university and a lot of other universities in America, they intentionally reduce the temperature of rooms because they believe that when you are cold, you are more alert. But it worked absolutely the opposite. Way. Because when I was cold, I would cocoon, and then I would become a little lazy and slow down. It sounds very weird. Why, how can a human being's reaction be so different? How does it matter if you were born in America or born in India? You're still a human being. No, there is a difference. I'll give you some examples. The romantic songs and the love songs in the West are about sunshine. Our love songs are about monsoon. It's just the opposite. I remember this many years ago. I was in Norway and it happened to be my birthday that day. And my friend's grandmother said, Ashmit, son, hope the sun shines always on you. And it occurred to me, it's just the opposite of what my grandmom would have said. My grandmom would have said, may the shade always be on you. Isn't it so? Isn't it so? It is just opposite. So if we mindlessly adapt what works there, over here, it would not work. It's a different problem. It needs to have a different solution. We don't even have that disease for which we are consuming the medication. The problems in India are very different. The problems over there are very different. Now, West societies talk about trends and can't talk about fashion. In realistic terms, we can't talk about fashion. Fashion essentially is a fourth month cycle. We don't even update our merchandise according to it. So we are more trend based. Sometimes we are also fad based. Now, the fad culture also works much more strongly in the West because people have a lot more disposable, which is very strongly happening 
in India. And I would say only in the past five years, India has seen a huge change in terms of access to it. You see, uh, we designed for a few luxury labels in India. And uh, the data that we get from them is the maximum, you know what is the maximum kind of merchandise in the apparel division, apparel and luxury lifestyle? What sells most among Yes, please. Perfume? Uh, yes, they sell a lot in, in quantity, but not in terms of price value. Perfume is a very high quality seller. Yes, that's right, in terms of quantity. What do you think is the higher, what contributes most in terms of sales from the stores? Perfume sales are very high from department stores, but not from luxury stores. Because we don't even have so many luxury stores. I mean, what do we have? We have one mall in Delhi, we have uh, a smaller mall in Bangalore, and another smaller mall in Bombay. So luxury stores are very different. Earlier they used to be restricted only to five star. Now we're still having some retail establishments. Yes, please. Bags. 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 Yes, yes, in a way. Accessories. Accessories sell more than garments. And you know why they sell more than garments? What's their observation? They've not only said that bags sell more than garments. They've also, because there is no choice, they also have to understand why does it sell more. Because if they understand why does it sell more, one, they can sell it even more. And second, they can sell something which is not selling so much. The reason is because accessories can be worn with multiple different things. So you get the maximum bang for your buck. While how many times can you wear the same jacket? How many times can you wear the same shirt? But the belt gives you a larger rollout. An accessory gives you a larger rollout. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Temperature. I'm going to show you a slide. I'm going to, in fact, show you two slides. Observe your reaction. Not the other person's reaction. Only your reaction. See how you feel. It will only again happen in a fraction of a second. Did you feel a little cold? A little? Did you shrug a little? So let's make you warmer again. Does it make you warmer? Does it make you cold again? Does it make a difference? <coughs> Notice the movement of your eye, the pupil delight. Reduces. Eyes become wider, isn't it? Why would the eyes become wider? Because what is known medically, biologically, is that when you have more light, you're likely to reduce your eyes, right? If there's a lot of light coming, what do we do? We reduce our eyes, right? But the exact opposite happens over here. You're getting more light and your eyes are opening even more. In darkness, your eyes actually are supposed to open more so that you can absorb more light so that the brain can get all the signals that it wants. So why would it happen just the opposite? It happens just the opposite because this is hostile, cold. When you say this person is cold, that's a cold environment. It's got nothing to do with the temperature. Or why is the color of money green anywhere in the world? Only except for a couple of countries which have started doing it only since a decade or so. Color of money was always green in any culture. It is not because no other country had technology to print any other color. It certainly can't be the reason. I'll tell you the reason for this one. This is a warm environment. You would like to be in this because there is no hostility. It's more comforting. So you're likely to absorb more information from it. And it is unfortunate that if you don't like a source, you don't like the information. Sometimes, if you did not like a teacher in your school, you probably hated the subject. And you probably landed up hating the subject for the rest of your life. It is not the teacher's loss, it is the student's loss. But because those things happen, and that's the human element, and we are selling to humans who are buying because of emotional needs, we have to take into a huge aspect all of these criteria. If we don't, then we're just selling them saman, just goods. Then a shirt also boils down to a good 
than even a 10 lakh rupee necklace or solitaires boiled down to goods. They don't come up themselves to become a part of the light. This is an important theory which works in, in all formats of retail, all formats of life basically. Uh -huh. I must share that I did about 12 years of study after school. Uh, I managed uh, uh, two PhDs, two doctorates. I was awarded the third one. I'm working on my fourth one right now. This particular theory paid for my entire bachelor's, master's, and of course you get money from the university when you do your PhD in America. The theory of opulent spaces. Now I'll explain the word opulent just in case. The word opulent means anything which is better. Not good, better. Not grand, but grander. Not nice, but superior. So it needs to have a context. Now everything needs to have a context, of course. Opulent would be things which you in your mind perceive are better than you in terms of social structure, economics, education, um, or the level of respect. So for instance, opulent space for a student in school could be the principal's room if he is called in the principal's room for the first time. There's that scary element. Opulent space for a person could be that if he's going for a very important interview and his interview is with the head of the company and he's supposed to meet them for the first time. That becomes an opulent environment. Opulent environment becomes uh, a very high-end five-star hotel for the all sorts of five-star hotel, but the really superior five-star hotel becomes an opulent environment. But at the same time, opulent environment is only opulent if it creates a level of defensiveness for you. If it does not create a level of defensiveness for you, then it's not opulent. So the principal's room for the peon is not opulent because he goes there probably 10 times in a day. If you go to a particular coffee shop in a five-star hotel, in a very high-end five-star hotel, if you're going there for the first time or the second time, or you go there rarely, it is opulent for you. If you go there often, it is not opulent. So the theory states that the moment you enter into a space which you feel is more opulent than you are, the moment you enter into that space, your voice coils drop down. Even biologically, the thousand comes down. Your voice becomes thicker. You speak less words per minute at a lesser volume. Hands come closer to the body. Footsteps narrow down. In fact, as a human being, you shrink. Even your vision retracts and becomes focused. And I might not be able to, as a result, listen to you, but I'll be able to listen to you right at the end. I can do selective hearing. All of that happens because of defensiveness. I'll give you an example, for instance. If you're sitting in a car, not driving, sitting with a co-driver, sitting with the driver, you're the co-driver, and you don't have a lot of driving experience with that driver, Okay? It could be a friend, it could be a taxi guy, it could be anyone. But you don't trust them completely. And if they're driving very fast, your vision reduces. You're only now able to see the road, you don't even see the trees and the shops. So you're retracting. It's really the other one. When you have, when you're sitting with somebody very formally, or the level of defensiveness, which is again coming from volumetrics. So if I have to be, or I have to show you that I'm in an opulent space, and you have to gauge that I'm in an opulent space on the basis of how comfortable I am. Do I look more comfortable like this? Or do I look more comfortable like this? This? Or this? This one? Okay. So, do I look more comfortable? You have to observe this because I'm going to come to a conclusion after this. Do I look more comfortable like this? Or do I look more comfortable like this? Like this? Do I look more comfortable like this? Or do I look more comfortable like this? The previous one. So if you observe what is happening, is if you look at me from the plan, you know what a plan is? When you look at things from the top. If you look at me in the plan, the only difference, because if we can't quantify it and use it, then it becomes trivia and unnecessary information. None of us is able. The point is to get this information and to use it. If we know about body language, and we've not studied body language, majority of us have probably no experience in studying body language, 
but you know which looks more comfortable. And your brain is doing this comfort calculation based on an algorithm and a formula. And that formula is dependent on how much space as a human being am I taking for my presence. The lesser space I take, the more uncomfortable and non-confident I look like. The more space I take, the more confident I look. Isn't it so? So what are you looking at? You're looking at human being as a plan. And hence, you can replicate the thing in your stores to either make your people contract and make them shrink and make them defensive, which a lot of boutiques are supposed to do because you don't expect a lot of people to come in and look at the merchandise and only increase the housekeeping. Why? Besides, if I have a budget of only 500 rupees and the other guy has, is in the store where the shirt costs 10,000, I'll be very defensive. I'll hate my experience, which is fine. I'm not that mind any this. But the 10,000 rupee guy is going to hate his experience too because of me. Because I will have questions, with all due respect, worth 500 rupees. So I will be in a mode of rejection towards that 10,000 rupee shirt. Because I can't accept. That's a human tendency. You can't accept what you do. You reject. That's the only way for us to receive intelligence. So theory of opulent space works, for instance. Let's say you're going to a very high-end five-star where you haven't been before. Or you've been told that it's very high-end and you haven't been there before. And if you're speaking on your regular cell phone in a regular volume, the moment you enter the doors, your phone comes closer to your face. And the voice reduces. Isn't that so? Try to do that. It will always happen. I need a volunteer to explain one more concept. Um, and it'll help. It's going a little long. Can I have a volunteer? For a minute. Please. Thank you. Come on that side. Yep. So I'm going to ask That's you to walk Anna. towards me. Okay? When I do, you do that. Come. Please come to your left. Exactly. Thank you. That was it. And I'll explain you what happens. You see, of course she knows the left side. Of course she knows that is her left side. But I controlled her mind to go in the wrong direction. I told her to go left, you all heard, and this is, this is no magic show. I did not hypnotize her. You can do this at home and you will find almost everybody doing exactly what this. And again, if you don't understand why it happens, or more importantly, how can we use it in our store environment? She is coming from a thought process that she has to buy a bag. Excellent. Or she has to go left or right or whatever she has to. But as a store designer, as a graphic artist, as a visual merchandiser, you can control the speed and the direction that your client is going into. That's what I did. I could be a mannequin. I could be a graphic. I could be a video work. I could be anything. I could be just a line on the floor. And we have to. It has to happen. There is no exception. Thank you again. What do you think this is? Take a guess. Of course, none of you would know what it is unless you do. Take a guess. Sorry? It's a leg Yeah, what, what do you think this place is? This space is? Sorry? I, I didn't get you. A changing room? It is actually a changing room. Yeah. It is actually a changing room. And this changing room works in a way that this is an opulent space. So in an opulent space, how do you get opulence? How do you get opulence? There is basically one criteria. The cheapest criteria to get opulence is to get the sense of space. Largeness is almost always more opulent than small but luxurious elements. In this particular case, the customer does not even see the sales staff. Does not need to. Does not want to interact with the person bottom of the line. With all due respect, it, is, it can be said true for the Indian luxury industry that if I want to, or if you want to, go and buy a jacket for 40,000 rupees for day wear to go to your office, 
the salesman who is trying to sell you will not even be able to afford it on his own wedding. So should you be taking his opinion? Obviously not. It's like taking the advice of an unmarried marriage counselor. They can give you advice. Or the advice of people who don't have kids but they give advice how kids are to be born, to raise, you know, how to preach to them. Once they have their own, they know. They shouldn't have spoken in the first place. In this particular case, the salespeople are on the other side of the changing room. And the way these two glass shutters is, there are glass shutters on that side. So the merchandise gets put over there and the client removes it from here. So there is no interaction. This one's also specific because of the hijab culture. That the women don't want to be in, in contact with the salespeople, or at least not. But again, it really works. Look at this phrase. What do you think this is? It's a bar? Close? Yeah, bar, restaurant? Yes. Close? What do you think? Cheap or expensive? Expensive? What do you think of the cost of execution? Cheap or expensive? Would you rather spend the same amount as you would do in any regular restaurant and get an environment like that? But do you also think if you want to have a friendly chit chat with your friend, catching up over a coffee, would you prefer this place? No. Why not? Is the store staff saying anything to you? Is the general manager stopping you? No. Why not? It's the space, where the space acts like a silent salesman, which is the most important salesman. Because the salesman can lie, the salesman can have lack of information, the salesman can be temperamental, the salesman could sneeze, could cough, could not be dressed up properly, or could happen within any of the X factors, which could be like a slip between the cup and the lip. But the store would not go wrong. And that's what we have to do. It does not cost a lot. But at the same time, you have to understand that every space has a psychology of its own. The psychology of this space. Do you actually expect loud chitter chatter over here? It's always going to be calm, toned down. That's the space pushing. Not expensive to make at all. The third one is value comes with abundance. Which basically means our perception of the price point and the quality of any particular product goes up if it is scarce in number and goes down if it's quantum in number. So have a look at the slide. Again, your reaction will only be for a fraction of a second. And tell me about the positioning. Cheap or expensive? Cheap. How many people for cheap? How many people for expensive? So let's look around for statistics because we are all each other's clients. How many people for cheap? How many people for expensive? Look at it. Is it actually cheap? This is embroidery. This is sequin. So is this work. Can you see the laser pointer at all? You see the top row? Quilted, embroidered, silk. Is it actually cheap? Is it? It's not cheap at all. But it looks cheap, thanks to the brilliant little merchandiser. <laughs> yeah, that's where you go wrong. Or that's where you can go right too. Maybe you want to portray as if it is inexpensive. Then this works brilliantly. Usually it shouldn't be. Usually if you're expensive, you need to come across as much higher quality than what you're charging. Only then would you be perceived as somebody reliable. Right? No client would want you to please them. But if you look at the merchandise, the merchandise is expensive. But the display does not connote that at all. So how you display can talk to the client in terms of what to expect as a price point and quality. Your merchandise could be anything. Your quality could be the top or it could be the third. Point. But the perception will be the key criteria for the client to choose to buy or not buy or even to stay in the store or to leave. We might have heard of this statistic that the longer you are in a store, the more likely you are to buy. Have you heard of that? Yep. I don't completely agree with that. Uh, for example, I go with a friend of mine and he's interested in shopping. 
So he is looking around, he is shopping, he is trying things, and I am just with him, sitting on a place, maybe going through my phone now. Five years ago, the example would have meant a lot of other things, because the phones would not be so entertaining. But now the phones take up a lot of time. And even when people have two or three minutes, they would go on their phone, do a WhatsApp, or an email, or a Facebook, or something. Yeah? Even two or three minutes we get, some people have that habit of opening the phone up, even on traffic lights. A few seconds. So consider my friend is looking around, trying things, and I'm just sitting. Is there any scope for the store to increase their revenue per square feet through me? No, not even five years ago. But the way they can increase their revenue per square feet is to be able to make me walk in the store. Now imagine if I'm walking, looking here or looking there, does that not increase my chances of buying? So it is not the quantum of time. That's one measure. It is the quantum of effort and other senses that you get involved. Same thing as what we talked that you don't remember a single billboard or a traffic, but you remember the door that you opened a week ago. Because there are multiple skill sets involved, multiple senses involved. And the brain has, of course, quadrants to choose what you are investing in. And the more you land up investing, the more likely you are to remember it. And we, my, my dad used to tell me, and my brother as well when we were kids, that write it down. You know, if you try to remember it, there's no guarantee you would remember it. But if you write it down, even if you tear it away and you throw it, you would remember it. We didn't agree, of course, both of us brothers. No. We'll remember. But many years ago, uh, almost 10 years ago, and almost 15 years after he told us that, I studied in psychology that he was right. And there's a psychological explanation. The explanation is the same, that multiple senses are being involved. When I think of remembering something, there are basically only one emotion or one sense which is being involved, which is speech. When we're trying to remember something, we usually land up speaking in the mind. And you will also notice that if you're reading something versus when you're reading it loudly, you are more intending to remember it or to understand it better because there's one more sense being involved. But if you also write it, there's motor skill involved. So for instance, if I have to grab a glass of water, as I was saying, I will be calculating the distance, the heaviness, how much water there is, how much do I have to tip, you know? Because I'm not washing the glass, I'm looking at you. So I have to be cautious that I have to tip it only so much that I get water and not over tip it so that it becomes an overflow. And how much quantity do I need to sip? That is also based on my calculation of the temperature of the liquid. And that finally I need to stop gulping or stop breathing and start gulping because we can't breathe and gulp at the same time. It's a very long process. But because we do it often, we don't think about it. It's like the brain works in two different kind of parts. There's a secretary brain, or it's assistant, uh, assistant brain, and there's a major brain. Now, major brain works about things which are new to us. For example, the first time that we landed up learning how to drive a car, then we would be very cautious. Oh, we have to press the clutch, press the brake, pr change the gear, look at the speedometer. Oh, it's 40, now we have to press, press the clutch, indicator, this, that. But after a time, that when you get used to it, you don't even think about it. Because it actually goes to the assistant brain. You don't need to think about it. When you have to write something, you don't think about writing. Let's do a quick experiment. Can you guys, everybody just grab a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper to write on? Everyone? Yeah and that piece of paper in front of you where you have to write it down. You could put the piece of paper on the desk and have your pencil ready or your pen ready. Yep, everyone's ready. So I request you to now close your eyes, close your eyes and write down, I name is, and write down your name. Close your eyes. Keep your eyes closed and write, my name is, and write down your name. Now open your eyes and see. Isn't that correct the way you've written it? Is there a single mistake? It's not even a single mistake. Because the brain has so much potential. The brain right now is calculating the ambient sound. That sound which is happening in the background is called ambient sound. And if it continues for more than a minute, it becomes something which is called white noise. White noise is important for stores. It helps us, uh, you know, like this one. While this becomes a noise in itself, it's going to cut down other noises. So the noise of the air conditioner, the noise of the fan, slow music, anything which is very consistent. 
we don't register it anymore. But it helps us soothe down. That's the connotation that we provide in terms of what fountains and water bodies. That it creates that kind of sound which kills other sounds. So, looks cheap and expensive. How about this? What is this place? What do you think it is? Sorry? An art gallery. Okay. But if I say it's a clothing store, doesn't the clothing store look like the quality of an art gallery? And your perception goes up? Are you not better off losing a little space and not putting merchandise there and still increasing your revenue per square feet and giving a higher sense of perception to the client and making him feel good about your product and making him compare your X price factor to something which is X plus? What do you think they're selling? Cosmetics or skincare? Skincare. Now, we can't see what they're selling. It could be cosmetics. But we would like to believe it's skin care. Now, nothing happens without a reason. And there has to be a reason why it looks the way it does. Any guesses what are the reasons? What do you think? Sterility. You see how white it is? That's sterile. That's clinical. But does it look like a cold, sterile environment? No. And why is that? Yes, some amount of graphics, playful on the ceiling, and hugely the floor. Before we enter into any space, we look at the ceiling. We might not remember it, because the ceiling tells us where to walk and how to walk. And then we notice the floor, because the floor tells us that we shouldn't get into an accident. That is the reason why you would never find somebody walking one step on a carpet and one step on another floor. You would not even usually find somebody walking on wooden laminate flooring and tile where the differential is not very high. A lot of times in opulent environments you will find people walking on a single color tile or stone, not even two colors. They're not noticing it. If you ask them, they probably wouldn't even know. But their brains calculated it. So I'm going to ask you a quick question. Let's say this is A. This is B, this is C, and that is D. Okay? So we have A, B, C, and D. Which one do you think is the most expensive product? How many people think A is the most expensive product? Okay, so let's look around for statistics. How many people think B is the most expensive product? How many people think C is the most expensive product? D? Okay. Now, nothing happens without a reason, right? You know why you chose as A the most expensive product? It's closed. Yes, definitely, sir. Because it's not for everyone. It's closed. What's the other important reason? Lighting. Yellow. I'm going to talk about lighting. But the more yellower it is, the more toned down, the more warmer, the more expensive it looks like. You will probably never find a fine dining restaurant in white light. Probably never. Because yellow tones are down. It's not that somebody has told the artists or the designers or the interior designers or the hospitality designers that you can't do a different lighting, but because it just doesn't work. McDonald's, even if it's empty, you become more dynamic. It's white light and it's bright light. As a rule of thumb, the whiter it is, the brighter it is, the more dynamic we become. The yellower it is, the dimmer it is, the more time you end up doing anything. So fine dining means about one and a half hours, two hours. You take three times more time to consume the same dalma. And the intention is that during that process, you're going to order other things which are going to be more expensive. So this one clearly becomes the most expensive. And nobody raised their hand for this. People raised, some people raised their hand for this. Why is this more expensive than that? Again, the same logic, covering. But that covering is something very coincident. This cover is just removed from here and put there, and sometimes it's removed from there and put here, as the client wants it. But that one on the top looks the cheapest. Because value comes with abundance. It is abundant. It's a huge quantity. Plus, what helps that theory go forward is the white light. So there is never just one theory which works, but a multiple amount of value. The other one, people beget people, people get beget trust. I mean, we all know that uh, 
if 10 people are standing at a particular shop and the next shop is empty, then we would like to think that where the 10 people are, that shop is better, is more successful, is more reliable, is better quality. But none of that has to be true. It's only a perception. Because if everybody is doing it, it must be right. And this becomes even truer in, since we have social uh, media marketing, you know, the advent of Facebook and all, whatever your friends and your colleagues are likely to like, you're more likely to look at that. So it's not only the quantum of people, it is the kind of people like you. If more kind of people like you are doing it, it's more likely to be correct. And the last one is tree of refuge. Tree of refuge theory, which comes from environmental psychology, talks about that throughout our evolution, we have been living under things which were bent. The caves were bent, the trees were bent. In fact, there is nothing straight in nature. And uh, technically speaking, there can never be anything straight on Earth anyway, because Earth itself is not. So even if something is appearing to be straight, it will be bent with the contour of it. Uh, Man-made things can be straight out. So basically what the theory talks about is that we are more comfortable with spaces which are curved rather than spaces which are very straight lines. In fact, in the term of interior designing, straight line is also called minimal. And minimal is not an Indian habit, especially. And generally speaking, not a human habit. In India, we don't even throw even half-broken things. We are accumulated, isn't it so? So it doesn't work. So three of refuge also says that we are more comfortable around things which are bulkier. So if you notice in your home or in your office or in your workspace, you would most likely be more comfortable either at a corner seat or a chair, even if it's in the center, next to a large piece of a lira or a column or something heavy because it gives us a fake sense of comfort. It takes away uh, the habitation. Color. Of course, anything that has to do with vision has to do with color, but anything that has to do with color is dependent on light. Really healthy because this has been researched time and again in terms of how it works on human beings. This is the way the Munsell color system works for instance, based on this chart, where you create different kind of color spectrums. Now computers create colors on the basis of this, which is basically working on two different colors and making them uh, attractive or unattractive, not for general people, but for very specific target audience. For instance, the most attractive color scheme is known to be the complementary color scheme because they're the colors which are absolutely opposite in terms of its wavelengths. So they will always be very attractive. Of course, white and black are not even the colors. And then you would maneuver this. Few of the reactions which have been accumulated for in general, but for instance, you know, the color of grief or mourning in the West is black. But coincidentally, it is also the color of dynamism, enjoyment, business. In India, the color of grief uh, is white and saffron. So it's very, very different. Our connotations are different and becomes very different from China and so on. But on a major level, all these connotations and I'll read out of here, for instance. Green is the color of nature, right? Yeah? I, I mentioned I'm working on my doctorate right now. One of the things that I'm studying or researching on is that I believe, yes, green is the color of nature, but when it comes to indoors, green is not the color of nature by far. Isn't that true? Imagine green interiors. Does it ever reflect nature? Brown does. Isn't it a weird observation? But the point is, this observation could have come hundreds of years ago. Why nobody did it? It's a small thing. When it gets done, then it helps all the design industry. I'm going to read from this one. If you see, if I'm going to read red, then orange, both the oranges over there, is going to be in between the yellow and the red. So the red in this case is energy, courage, passion, harvest, glory, mature, love, drive, inner strength, romance. And if I look at the gold, yellow, it is enthusiasm, it's fame, 
It is happiness, influence, confidence, satisfaction. If I look at the orange, it would always be in between. Because you have some extreme reactions when you see extreme colors. But if you have to get a mix of reactions, what do you do? You mix those colors in different connotations and the mind can read it. This is very important. In the next couple of slides, every time I would change the slide, I want you to pay attention to what is the first thing that you see. The first thing. Not two, not three. I would also like to tell you that our eyes are incapable of, of course, looking at things the way a camera does. We like to think that you are able to see the entire screen in one shot. It is impossible. It is impossible for the human eye. Fact is, you can't even see the same thing in two different realms. If you try to focus on my hand, the screen will go bloody and hazy. If you focus on the screen, my hand will go bloody and hazy. You cannot even see both the things together. At the same time, if you're likely to see this, and if you're likely to see this, you will not be able to look at them at the same time. You will find there is an eye movement, which basically means the eyes are incapable of looking at large picture in detail. What we do is, what actually happens as a process, that when we look at anything, the brain is interested in the larger picture because it's to do with life sustenance. Defense mechanism. Aggression always comes in later. First, the only purpose, of course, the large, biologically speaking, the larger purpose of the brain is to keep you alive. To keep you healthy is the second purpose. To keep you happy comes way later. But the first one is only to keep you alive. So, if somebody is reading profusely from one hand and a little bit from the finger, the brain will not even tell him that he is bleeding here. The brain will only talk about the pain over here. If you have two teeth paining, one is paining a lot, the second one which is paining a little, you would not even know. The brain works in a funny way. If you put your one hand in boiling water and in the other hand you hold ice, the brain will tell you, it's all right because it's taking the reaction from both of them and averaging it out. It's ridiculous. That's the way it works with all of us. So, the first thing that you see, and if you think that is the first thing, and majority of us think that is the first thing, then almost everybody who's outside this room see that as the first thing. And almost all of those people are your clients. So, retailers, Merchandisers, visual merchandisers, fashion designers, we might be spending a lot of effort into designing everything about a merchandise or an object, thinking that the client is going to look at all those details. They're not. <coughs> so there's no point spending time and money there because you're not spending your time and effort. You're spending theirs because you will land up charging for your time and money from them. So you're increasing their cost and you're making them unsuccessful and they're not even participating, okay? Can, can we reduce these lights for a minute? All right, we're ready? Here. What was the first thing that you saw? How many people saw focus? Not everybody needs to see focus. How many people saw focus? Okay, who else saw something else? And they're all valid answers. Did anybody see anything else? Yes, sir, what did you see? Back? Somewhere here? Okay. Yeah, because it's legible, yes? So there is a tendency to look somewhere around that. However, majority, when I say majority, I mean a lot above 90% will be able to see focus. Now, why do we see focus? Did I ask you to look in the center? In fact, it's not even in the center. Though the brain is actually tuned to look at things in the center. So all old photography used to have the subject right in the center. 
all old paintings used to have the subject mostly in the center. What is the new contemporary way of doing things? Off center, isn't it? If you see a lot of campaigning and all, you usually don't have mannequin or model in the center. You probably have the car she's leaning on, and you're not selling the car, you're selling the dress, and she's on the off center. Just to create a level of interest. Why did we see focus first? Any guesses? It's legible, yes. It's red, yes, yes. Both of them are right. It's legible, it's right. Now, what is the definition of legibility? The definition of legibility is if you understand it. That logo is red too. And a lot more red. But you did not see that. Because this is different and that is consistent. So the brain's not interested in that. Look at the next thing. What do you see? What did you see? Fraction of a second. Triangle? How many triangles are there? How many? No, not two. How many? No, not two. Not four. No. Nine? No. No. Zero. Zero. There is no triangle. There is no triangle. But the brain sees a triangle. The brain sees a triangle because brain wants to be successful. And the only way to be successful is to be able to understand and decipher what has been given to us. If we don't understand something, that's called foolish. So the brain overcompensates for the information. That is one of the reasons why sometimes, even if the spellings are wrong, we read it right. But the brain is overcompensating. It is dangerous. There is a possibility that those are not the wrong spellings, but the right spellings of a word that you do not know. That's about legibility. So we lose out because of the overcompensation. No triangles here. The law is called Gestalt. And Gestalt talks about that if I do this, a lot of people will see it as a circle. So, for instance, that's an what is 1 plus 1? Not necessarily 2. Not necessarily 2 at all. We should, we should cross question this particular question and state that this is probably an incomplete question. What if I said 1 apple plus 1 orange? Is it 2? No. So when we look at the creative aspect of it, things have the potential of being very different. Because if things cannot be different creatively, then the design education should have already ended a few thousand years ago. Because everything which could have been done by what we had, we have already done it. The purpose of creativity is only to look at the same thing with a brand new angle, figure out a little difference, exaggerate that difference, and sell it. How many squares? None. But don't we see it like a square? If, if there is any audience who have played Pac-Man game, it used to be an old Pac-Man game, they would see Pac-Man before they even see square. Is that true? What is it again? Legibility. The brain is tuned to see what it knows. If there are a thousand people coming from that side, there are a thousand faces, but you would not even see a single face. But if there was one face that you recognize, you will see that one face, rather than thousand faces. What is it again? Legibility. So what does it talk to us in terms of visual merchandising? If you create legibility, which means if you create a sense of awareness in the display window, and if you recreate it inside the shop, to him it becomes legible. So, in the wrong word, you actually made the client more gullible towards what you want to tell them. I heard this in many, many years ago. And I must admit, when I heard it, I found it extremely <laughs> foolish. You know, almost embarrassing that, oh my God, such a large professor of ours, such a huge aura to himself. And this kind of silly statement he made. But it dawned upon me many years later that he was so right. He said, that any presentation, and this was a marketing class, he said for your target audience or for your listeners or just about anyone, if you have to tell them something, the best way 
if you, if you have to ensure that it works. You tell them what you will tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. And it sounded extremely stupid. But I'll give you an example. For the people who've studied Hindi in school, you might remember there was a prasang, a vyakya, and a bhav, which is exactly the same thing. They told us what they will tell us. They told us about the poet, where he's coming from, what is he going to talk about. Then they tell us what is he talking about. Then they tell us what he talked about. It really works. It's about longevity. So you communicate on the print advertisements, on computer, on television, what the customer should be expecting. Then you deliver to him in the display window or in your in-store displays what he should be expecting. He's now getting it firsthand. And at the last point of contact, which is usually the cash count, you recreate so that he feels successful and intelligent about the option that he took. Usually the last point of contact, which is the cash counters, is the most horrific counter in a lot of retail stores. Or sometimes the last point of contact is the guard who opens the gate for you with half a mood and half a mind. That's what the client remembers. You know, somebody might say brilliant things for half an hour, fantastic. But if he says something really stupid in the last one minute, then the entire conversation lands up averaging to that stupid level. Ending becomes very important. We have heard first impression is the last impression. I don't believe in that. Really. And if you look back in real times, does first impression actually make a last impression? No. If first impression has to make the last impression, then the last impression is already there. Why does this have to do all the effort to become that when that already exists? You've heard practice makes perfect? You believe in it? How many people believe practice makes perfect? Practice doesn't make perfect at all. Practice makes permanent. We all know tens of housewives who've been cooking for 20 years old and they still don't know how to cook. And if practice makes perfect, then we have been writing for at least 20 years. Our handwriting should be beautiful, is it? Practice makes permanent. People who've been driving on the roads, they've been driving for 10 years at least. They should be driving wonderfully. We should not even need street lights anymore or traffic lights because it only makes permanent whatever we are doing. And whatever we are doing, if we are comfortable in it, we don't need to change or we feel that we don't need to change. Our clients have become too comfortable in the way they are shopping. So online and the amalgamation of online coming into brick and mortar is paying time. Would you read out the top please? Yeah. Would you read it out loudly? Read the bottom. So do you see where one line is made, change the meaning? And you were controlled to read it the way the graphic designer has chosen for you to read it. It completely changes the meaning. It's like in Hindi, you know, they say, Roko mat jane do, Roko mat jane do where you put the comma completely changes the meaning of the statement. Or where you accidentally took a breath, changes the statement too. What was the first thing that you saw? And you don't have to pay attention to what is the first thing that you saw. You have to be aware of what was the first thing that you saw. What do you think you saw first? Sorry? The lines? Yes, actually the first thing that we see is always going to be lines because they're on the outer side of it. But because there are two of them and both of them are looking towards the center, so what becomes more important is where the two lines are looking and they're the same kind of lines. So the center becomes important and we might remember that we saw the first thing which was in the center. So the first flick always, the brain likes to get a larger picture and then we narrow down. If we did not have this ability, we can't read anything. Because when we read, we go word by word. But we already know where the paragraph is going to end and we start slowing down already. Because the writer wants us to slow down. Or the exclamation. So when something ends with an exclamation, 
you're supposed to read that word with a little bit of excitement because it changes the meaning. Now, uh, is there anybody in the room who does not understand Hindi? Hindi? Anybody who does not understand Hindi? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to say it in Hindi first because it, it makes the maximum impact and then I'm going to repeat it in English. So, let's say you're having tea in your room and I come to you and I say, Aap chai pi rahe? Or say, Aap chai pi rahe? Aap chai pi rahe? I said it three different ways and it changes the complete different meaning. So I said, being in sending English, I'm going to come and say, you're having tea? You are having tea? You're having tea? It completely changes the meaning. What I said was not different. How I said it was the difference. What you're selling, unfortunately, the majority of us are selling a very similar thing at a very similar price to the very similar client. And there's no differentiation. Differentiation can only come in terms of how we are doing it rather than what we're doing. Clients don't know. Clients don't know the difference between white shirt and the other white shirt and the other white shirt. They don't know the threads per account. They don't know uh, different kind of color cuts. They don't. They're dependent on information which retailers can provide to them. That is why they go and change the garments in the changing room, but they come outside and look themselves in the mirror. That is strange. Why do they do that? They do that because of all this going around in the mind. What is the first thing that you saw? Is it a good display or a bad display? Bad? Why is it bad? I promise you, you can't remember this example. You might forget every other. Why is this a bad example? It is bad. I mean, there's no wrong answer. I agree. It's good and bad, depending on uh, where you're coming from. Why is it bad? Shoes and food put together? Yes, that's a good answer. What else? Other reasons? Why is it a bad display? No, that's, that's the only answer? That's a very valid answer. I mean, by far, that's the answer. We don't associate food and footwear together. Maybe we should rethink it now. It's already time. It's been time for at least 100 years since the time Times of India opened up in India, I believe 125 years. But here's my question to you. Would you put books on the floor and use it as a footrest? Okay. Would you put magazines on the floor and be okay with it? Some people might be okay with magazines on the floor. But with newspaper, you clean dog poop and kitty litter. What is the damn difference? It's all literature. The difference is that a few thousand years ago, somebody told you that book is Saraswati and Saraswati is Devi and Devi is not supposed to be on the floor. And you heard that. They did not talk about the magazine, so you did not hear about it. And they could not even think about a newspaper, so they didn't tell you and you didn't hear it. What is the damn difference? Now books are being replaced by computers. So what are you doing with the computer? Every time you put your laptop back, you're going to put it on your head, bow to it, apologize and put it back. But we don't do that. So when the new thing happens, or the new material happens, the mindset to rework on that material should also change. You can't work with an old mindset on something which is absolutely new. And the exact vice versa, that wouldn't be true either. So for Indian retailers, even if you're selling Western wear, you can't forget that we're selling to Indians. The mindset is very different. And even if you're selling Western garments to, or sorry, Indian ethnic wear to Westerners, the mindset would not be same. At all, it can't be. It shouldn't be. And thank God it is not. That's the only reason why style is still alive and fashion still happens. Because each time a new fashion comes in, it does prove the previous fashion wrong. It has to. Otherwise, who's going to buy the next thing? So we have to change the way we are thinking. Because it is already inappropriate. It is already rudimentary, it is old, and it is just outright wrong and false. Pay attention to the next one. What is the first thing that you see? 
What? Green chairs? How many people saw the green chairs first? Okay, anybody else saw anything else? Did anybody see those red chairs at the back first? Okay, two people. Those red chairs at the far end? Okay, you saw those one first. How about this huge red? You didn't see this first? Because if we are talking about red, and if we have to calculate it on terms of square feet or surface area, isn't this a much larger quantity than that? But you didn't see it. So we just broke two rules. First rule we broke is that red is a an attractive color and that you will see it first because you did not. Clear. Yes? The other rule that we broke is that value comes with abundance. It is a lot of chairs, but it does not look cheap. Because there are multiple other theories which have to value as well. Because if design would work only on one or two or three or four or even only a hundred principles, then computer software would be doing design, not humans. The next one. What is the first thing that you saw? And the, and the feet. I personally like to believe that majority of the people will see this as the first thing. Is that true? Okay. There is a reason to it. The color of skin is actually the most attractive color for the human mind, more than red. We should also talk why red is a bold attractive color. Red is a bold attractive color not because it just is, or not because the wavelength. It is a bold attractive color because throughout evolution it's been the color of blood. When you see it on an animal, it was most likely food. When you saw it on a human being, it was most likely threat. In either case, it is life altering, life sustaining, or life prevailing. So it's selective perception. We would notice that first because the brain identifies it first. It makes most of our sense to the brain. So a few questions. I like to believe that the brain accumulates far more information than we are actually aware of, which is quite weird in a way because we own the brain and we are the brain rather than the body. But the brain is still calculating a lot of things which it does not feel important to tell us. For example, we are all breathing and blinking and you don't even know where your ten fingers are or your toes are or what is happening to this. Or when you go to writing something, you don't tell your hand to move this muscle or to move this muscle or anything. But the brain is calculating. It's just not telling you. There's no need because the assistant brain is it. Let's talk about this woman. I'd like to believe that you have a lot of information about this woman. And no answer is the wrong answer. So I'm going to ask you, what do you think about the confidence level of this woman? High or low? High? How many people think it's high? I think raising hands is more low. How many people think this is low confidence on the woman's part? OK, few. What about the education level? How many people think she's educated? How many people think she's uneducated? How many people think she's well educated, maybe beyond bachelor's degree? Just bachelors? How many people think she has traveled abroad? How many people think she has not traveled abroad? Just look around so that we know. Okay. How many people are not thinking? Participants. <laughs> How many people think she has traveled abroad? How many people think she has not traveled abroad? Okay. Do you see this guy? Do you notice this guy? How many people think the guy is more confident than the girl. Look around. How many people think the girl is more confident? Fact is, you had no information. But whatever you think is the truth for you. And if I try to tell you something else, you will listen to it, but you might not completely agree. And why should I do that in any case? I'm a retailer with many options. You feel free to choose whatever option you want to be, whatever you want to be dressed at, whatever you want to be perceived at, whatever gadget you want, whatever book you want to read, whatever subject interests you. I should be able to not only offer you the options, but to offer you the options in a way that it seems like you are choosing rather than I pre-selected. That's the only way to make your shop as a favorite destination for shop. Ah. I'm going to do this real quick. This is technical. 
How many visual merchandisers do we have in this room? Practicing visual merchandisers? Okay, so I'll just do it for you guys to speak. Uh, one item display is a display where there is only one item, never two, only one item. So only one dress, or only one bag, never two bags, only one pair of shoes, only one item, one item display. It is usually done to uh, promote something premium or luxury. So again, one item. You might have lots of props. In visual merchandising term, anything that is not for sale is a prop. So mannequin is a prop. Okay? Lighting is usually equipment because it's permanent. But if you're having special lighting coming in, then it's a prop. Anything which is part of the display to help the display look better or the merchandise to look superior, but it's not for sale in the prop. P R O P. So again, I want to use. This is a shadow box. So when you reduce a larger window to make something smaller appear, it'll appear better. One item display again. But what if they were selling the dress in the bag? Then it's not a one item. Then it is related merchandise. In related merchandise, merchandise which can be used together or worn together is related merchandise. So all of this is related. Okay. Uh, example of related merchandise would be, for example, car and alloy wheels and stereo system. But if somebody buys a car, somebody buys a new car, they're more likely to buy new alloys and a stereo system. So here's an Indian statistic for the garment trade. It is observed that a typical Indian man in the middle class to upper middle class category has three wearable tops to one wearable body. Which means if you have Five wearable pants, you will have 15 wearable shirts. You might have 30 shirts, but we usually move around only in those 10, 15, 7, 8, 10. Right? Three is to one. No. This is a statistic. But if we can't use it, it is unnecessary. It's trivial. So let's try to use it. If we know that the average middle class and upper middle class man has three wearable tops to one wearable bottom, we can use this information in a way that if you buy one pair of bottoms in my store, you're three times likely to buy a top. So you're susceptible. But if you buy a shirt, can I sell you a pant? Usually not. People who are into the apparel trade, you already know it. If you buy a car studio, would you buy a car? No. When you buy a car, you can buy a car studio. Sometimes it does not even make a difference in terms of the price point. The price point could be lower or higher, but it doesn't even matter. When people buy curtains, they're likely to buy cushions or they're susceptible to buy cushions in the home fashion industry. When they buy cushions, they're not likely to change their product. No. When people buy candle stands, they buy candles. But when they buy candles, they don't necessarily buy candle stands. Even though the candle might be more expensive than the candle stand. Related merchandise again. Line of goods is one kind of merchandise. So all bags, all dresses, you know, uh, all watches, any one kind, like a production line, line of merchandise. The next one is promotional. In a promotional, you're not selling a merchandise. You're selling an idea. You're promoting an idea. Promotional could be promoting the color red. Say, blue is the new red or something. It's promoting. In this particular case, they're promoting black and white. They've written fishing for compliments. And the moment you read that this says fishing for compliments, suddenly this looks like jellyfish. If you don't read fishing for compliments, it does not look like jellyfish. Institutional is about not about the merchandise, not about the brand, it's about you and the customer, not as a customer, but as a human being. So for example, if you, if India won the World Cup and some store says, congratulations India, we won, but not promote the merchandise, then it's institutional. Tata Tea does something which is institutional, the Jagore concept, but it does not completely become institutional because at the end of it there is Tata Tea. It will do something which was institutional, but at the end of it, it does not become institutional because it's promoting the product. So it has to be completely institutional, non-product centric, non-revenue centric. In this case, condiments. You will now get now. Done this today. And the last one is variety, in which anything that you sell in the store can be a part of the display. And the types of selling is realistic, which the way it sounds realistic, has to be realistic. Real life, real proportion, real merchandise. Semi-realistic or semi-realistic is real merchandise, but the prop setting does not have to be real. This is hypnotism going on, magic show and all. So semi-realistic again. 
the merchandise always has to be real. Environmental is the way things are to be used together should be displayed together. So if you're displaying back to school and there are kids with backpack, then you show a little background of school or of the bus stop or of the house that they're leaving. So it becomes a complete amalgamation as the picture has been brought three-dimensional in terms of the end. Fantasy is completely out of the box. Uh, it does not have to be real. It does not have to be about the product. It can be anything. Nothing real has to exist. So the two most effective displays which work is fantasy and institution. Because everybody is talking about the product. These two are the only ones where they lift you up from the product level and bring you to the brand level or invest in the brand level. <coughs> abstract. Abstract. Look at this example. Very attractive. It's vinyl pasted. It is not a broken glass. And this vinyl was asked to be removed after two hours by the police because it was creating a traffic havoc, even for the pedestrians. People were stopping to look at it. Uh, a quick seasonal theme based. A lot of times when we do Christmas decorations, we just do a Christmas tree and that's it. Why do that? If you, nobody remembers it. Everybody did Christmas trees and nobody remembers as a client who did what. Why not create selling space there too? You're able to increase your revenue per square feet and the clients like it. That's the Santa's workshop. Again, this has got to do with the legibility. We know it, we understand it. Tell me what theme is this? Don't go by what's written. What theme is this? Winters, Christmas, what are those shapes? Snowflakes, my quick question. Do snowflakes actually look like this? They don't. Who told you this? Some initial designer told you this. And now you're restricted that it's a snowflake. You've never thought that you can change the color and do it for Holi. And you can change the color and make it fireworks like Diwali. Who stopped you? Or you can do it the same way for Eid. It's nobody's copyright. The information is already out there. All we need to do is just look at it differently and make it usable. You are a nice person. No. Expensive to make because of its crispness. But can be done. Winters again, rather than just doing regular snow, make it exciting. Make it happy and glamorous. This. Valentine's. How about a screen which maybe shows a promotion or something? What do we typically do for Valentine's? Two teddy bears hugging each other, you could imagine. And that doesn't even sell. You can do this in any kind of a store environment. Right? Any gift shop can do it, any apparel shop can do it. When stores go on sale, they should not look down front. There are enough statistics available that people who like to purchase full price do not like to go when the sale is on. It is not because they don't like to save, they would love to save. They don't want to go and rub shoulders with people who are actually not the target audience. Sale does good. It actually introduces the other audience, which is not really the clientele, and brings them to the store level. And hopefully gets them to shop during the full time as well. But then the brand also has a demeaning it. Because of the brand, you have to be consistent. You can. I still know it's sale. It's going to be on sale. But it just looks better, inviting, and consistent. Inexpensive too, in all of these cases. It's about the focal point as well, what the eyes see first while they pay attention to what they do. So pay attention to focal, uh, general, like billboards, walkways, magazine you open, there will be a focal point. And then try to focus on that and incorporate into the doorway of your establishment. That's the last quick point. This is the way the world is heading now. It is new media into the stores. This is, we're incorporating video walls. We're incorporating live video. So on the live video, you could actually have mannequins running or walking or doing something with the merchandise that is available. Or you could run a photo shoot. Or you could run a video with the merchandise itself. Magic mirrors are in place too. The camera would quickly scan you. You don't need to go into a changing room. 
a lot of times people don't want to go to a changing room because they're worried about their hair or something. You would like something but you would not buy it because you don't have the time to go to a changing room. It's usually not the time, it's usually the intention. Mistakes here. Change between the merchandise. The other benefit what these video walls are going to get into is that it might not be possible for every store to have every merchandise in the store. In fact, as an experiment, you might not want to bring everything into the store. Maybe it sells, maybe it doesn't. But technology incorporates that. You only need to get it produced if you're not buying it to get enough statistics. I'd like to show you what is happening now. Uh, for example, what the new age of virtual merchandisers are doing in India. I have some examples from New Delhi. This is a display made in New Delhi. I believe this can be anywhere in the world. This can be in Milan, this can be in Paris, this can be in New York. And just two days before, it was this. Just two days. And that was the view. And after two days from this, it became this. And this is the inside of the shop. So notice the ceiling and the lights and the flooring, especially this one. Wood laminate flooring. I must tell you, this store provides furniture for the TV show Coffee by Karma. And if the owner did not tell me that, I would have not believed it. Because it doesn't look any good. So from this, to this. Two nights. The flooring is the same. The ceiling is the same. Some amount of lighting has been closed. Some other kind of lighting has been incorporated. New color paint. Their, their furniture and that one screen over there. The white screen. That's the only thing which has been added. Everything else is the same. If you notice the floor, it still has those cracks. It's still not installed. There's only so much you can do in two days. And this is all stood, not professional work. Also the basement which used to look like this, within two nights, became that. And then there are another location which used to look like this in the afternoon, the same night or the same day, from this to that. So those are the two students who worked out. I feel proud to tell you that these feathers cost of only the feathers, they've been pasted on MDF, was 40,000 rupees. The great thing is that we do have shops in India which sell feather like this and they have enough quantity to sell it for 40,000 rupees. His shop was not empty after we bought it. So there is every resource available in India if we try to look for it. If it can't be, you have online, you can source it. Uh, there are a few other examples. Student work inside stores. That's another student work. You see how uh, the words which are actually thermocol look softer? So the same thing, you cut out the thermocol, you put spray mount on it and then you take goose down feather. Or you take more thermocol and you put it in the blender so it becomes really uh, firm. Spray mount and then you just rub it over that so it gets that softer, wintry feel. Thank you. Thank you. There's any question I can quickly take. I'd like to attend to two questions, if at all. All right. Thank you. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. There's a question right here. Yeah, can I ask you a question, please? Yeah. Please. Uh, how important is consumer profiling to a good visual merchandising plan? Consumer profiling to a good visual merchandising plan. Uh, it is absolute necessity. If we don't know who we are talking to, then we can't be interesting to that person. If we don't know who the target audience is, then we can't be interesting to them. And of course, if we are likely to be a one size that fits all, we will not be able to fit anyone very well. 
It has to be extremely tailor-made. And that's the good thing about visual merchandising versus something permanent. Let's say retail design is more permanent. But visual merchandising is very dynamic. So you can take care of a particular target audience if you want in the daytime when you know a lot of college students are coming in. And you change the background, which could be done with a rolled vinyl or flex, like a roller blind, which will take less than a minute to bring a new backdrop at the back. And you change the category altogether. Some of the mannequins can move out, the other mannequins can come in. But absolute core detailing in terms of the target audience is a necessary. But that goes for even for retail design or for any kind of design. That, was that able to answer your question? Please. is which brands uh, in my opinion are doing it the best in terms of visual merchandising. I wouldn't be able to name the brands but I'll tell you this, any brand which is able to do it consistently does a good job. So I say if you're good quality, good service, stay good quality, stay good service. If you're terrible quality, terrible service, stay terrible quality, terrible service. Improvise gradually. Give an example. Let's say I go to a cafe coffee day. We all familiar with cafe coffee day, and they don't serve you on the table. So if I go to a cafe coffee day, and because it is maybe early hours or whatever, and the general manager is very personally courteous, he sends somebody over to take an order from me on the table, takes takes my order, takes my money, gets me back the money. I would love it. It's additional service. But the next time when I don't get it, which is their normalcy, I would hate it. I am going to a cafe coffee day thinking in my mind what I expect and what I want. I should get exactly that. There shouldn't be a so consistency. Any brand which is doing it consistently does it extremely well. Did you have a question? Was it the same question? You're in a store in a store contract. So how do you differentiate your visual Given Sometimes you can't control the lighting because it comes from the main seat. But you can. Sometimes you can control the music. Most of the times you can't. Sometimes you can control the flooring. Most of the times you can't because you can't change the tiling. But you can always paste a vinyl. You can do that. You can always put your own two or three mannequins. Having more merchandise on the floor is no guarantee you're going to sell more merchandise from the floor. Never happens. Because the client is not interested if you have 5,000 pieces. He's interested if you have the piece that he wants. Even if you have just one piece. So more quantity of merchandise does not lead to necessarily big sales at all. Sticks are right. Perceived stylish. How is it perceived stylish? Because before you go to a store, you already know what to expect. And they deliver. They become successful. Consider Mango. Consider Promo. Consider Benetton. Consider so many labels. Consider Arrow or Levi's or a Louis Philip. The person already knows what he's going in for. And he gets it. He feels successful. But if the brand tries to change this or that, I'll give you banana, uh, I'll give you Gap example. We're all familiar with the Gap. Yep. It is not that Gap can't design different kind of merchandise. Of course they can. They can design anything. They can design tuxedo if they want, but they know it will not sell. Because our association of Gap is with a particular kind of quality, merchandise, and price. If they make it better, we would not want to go there. If they make it worse, we would not want to go there. So they reduce the style 
and the quality and the price and they create another format which they call Old Navy and they increase it and they call it Banana Republic. But if this company tries to do it all, it might fail. Ferrari, ma Fiat might own Ferrari. But who's going to buy Fiat for multiple crores? Nobody. So specific. And a lot of companies try very hard to also hide this information. Bloomingdale's is owned by Federated, which is also owning Macy's. And the style quotient is very, very different. Or Henry Vendale, which is probably one of the most trendier stores in New York. And if you're the most trendiest store in New York, then you're one of the most trendiest stores in the world. They're all owned by the same company, including Bon Marche, whose perception is very low. So you'll have to narrow it down. In your shop and shop, see whatever you can change as a feel of it. Feel can also happen with the mannequins. It can, of course, happen with your pictures and the way you merchandise. If everybody is doing, and this decision has to be taken on the shop floor, you can't make a one grid and say it will go everywhere. Because who knows who is along with you in another store? So if you're jewelry, you can change your location and all of that kind of stuff. Some larger format stores are now also providing light points towards the shop and shop. And if they're not, then they will not, unless the shop and shop guys start requesting for it in a large number, then you will have it. When you have it, your signage will be lit. It will be better. It will be cleaner. If there is a lit signage, the customer sees the lit signage first and then the merchandise. So it basically means the store becomes cleaner. Even the bigger store becomes cleaner. Rather than seeing 10,000 colors, you're only able to focus on some of the broader categories. That. Thank you so much. You're running out of time, but maybe we can take some of the balance questions offline. Thank you so much. Can we have a round of applause for this absolutely riveting session?